So good morning. Um, my name is Gloria Ye, and I am the Director of Clinical Research here at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. Uh, welcome to our monthly Grand Rounds series, which is held virtually uh, the first Tuesday of every month at 8 a.m. So thank you very much for being here this morning. Um, before we uh, actually get started with today's presentation, uh, a couple announcements that I'd like to start with. And the first is uh, to tell you about next month's um, Grand Round speakers. So as you may know, we have uh, a NIH T32 funded postdoctoral research fellowship in integrative medicine. And next month, our Grand Rounds will showcase some of the very interesting and diverse research that our fellows um, are leading. So we'll have three short presentations from three current or recently graduated fellows, uh, Dr. Jacqueline Foley, who's a clinical psychologist um, whose work is around behavioral interventions for HIV and cardiovascular disease, um, Dr. Michael Dadko, who is a neuroscientist looking at mindfulness and vagal nerve stimulation with neuroimaging, and Dr. Amy Yang, who's trained in traditional Chinese medicine, who will share some very interesting work looking at the physiology of um, acupuncture points. Uh, the second announcement is to ask you to save the date, September 18th to 19th, uh, later this year, 2023, for an international conference on the state of the science of Tai Chi and Qigong as whole person health that uh, Dr. Peter Wayne and myself are co-chairing. So the theme of this conference is advancing the integration of mind-body practices in contemporary healthcare and will focus on Tai Chi and related movement-based mind-body practices. And you can find further information on, um, on the OSHA website regarding, uh, regarding this conference. Okay, so uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our uh, very esteemed speakers this morning, Drs. John Porter and Joshua Pl uh, Plavin. Um, and they'll be speaking on creating an integrative effective and financially sustainable program for individuals with chronic pain experience and outcomes uh, at the University of Vermont. Uh, so Dr. John Porter is founding medical director of the Comprehensive Pain Program at the University of Vermont Medical Center and the director of the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine uh, at, uh, at the University of Vermont. So our sister Osher Center. Uh, he received his MD from the University of Washington and completed his residency and chief residency at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Uh, he's also a clinical assistant professor of family medicine at the University of Vermont Larner College of Medicine, where he also holds an appointment in the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, Dr. Joshua Plavin currently serves as the associate medical director at the Comprehensive Pain Program and is Assistant Professor of Family Medicine and Psychiatry at the University of Vermont Larner College of Medicine. He received his MD and MPH from the New York Medical College and his MBA from Brandeis University and is board certified in both internal medicine and pediatrics. Uh, prior to his time um, at the University of Vermont, he worked at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont as the VP and the Chief Medical Officer. So join me in welcoming um, our uh, speakers, Dr. Porter, Dr. Plavin. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much, Gloria. Um, and delighted to be here and appreciate um, the invitation to share some of our work uh, with you. And thanks to uh, Gloria and Peter and Emma for um, making this all happen this morning. Um, I am John Porter. I'm going to take a moment and share my screen and trust in the technology gods that we are all set. How does this look, uh, Gloria? Is this okay? Looks good. All right, good. So um, Gloria did a nice job of, um, of introducing us. I want to just acknowledge that we have no financial uh, disclosures to acknowledge other than Dr. Plavin's um, ongoing work as a case reviewer for Blue Cross um, and Blue Shield. And before we really get into the, to the meat of our presentation today, um, at, at our meetings here and um, both in clinical settings and in our administrative and clinical meetings, we always take time at the beginning and uh, at the end as we can 
uh, for an opening and for a time of, um, of meditation and coming into self. And our colleague, Aaron Bingham, who is nurse practitioner, a yoga therapist, um, is here to help us with that. So thank you, Aaron. Thank you, John. Can everyone hear me? Yes, coming okay. Through. Great. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm going to lead you through a brief, a brief breathing exercise and then into some visualization. Um, and as you're doing the visualization, I just want you to remember that you can always come back to your breath um, and you have control of your mind. So with that, set aside anything that is distracting. Maybe close down your eyes if that feels okay to you. And I'm gonna invite you this morning to come into your breath to begin. Just find a rhythm of your inhale and your exhale and let go of any distracting thoughts that come up for you and continue to focus on your breath. And as you're breathing, picture in your mind yourself in pain. So imagine a time in your life when you have been in pain. And try not to get lost in the story, but instead notice how you felt in that image. Notice how you felt physically. Remember during your experience of pain, what your mind was going through, what kind of thoughts you might have been having. Maybe accessing the emotions that you were feeling as well as you were in pain. If you're imagining yourself in pain, notice even right now, is there something different about the way you're breathing, about the way you're holding yourself? How are you feeling in your body in this moment as you imagine yourself in pain? Now let go of that image and imagine yourself at your very best, at your peak. Imagine how you're feeling physically when you are at your best. Notice how you breathe when you're at your best. Notice how your body is feeling. How are you feeling physically? What position is your body in when you're feeling your best? Where does your mind go when you are feeling your best? So imagining yourself at your best, what's your physical, mental, and emotional state like? And I'll invite you now to breathe into that place. Breathe into your best self. Maybe take a few more deep breaths, expanding the lungs completely, breathing yourself a little bit bigger, maybe breathing yourself a little bit taller. Allow the breath to be free and open. And for a moment, just honor the difference between, if there was one, between how you were feeling when you were in pain and how you were feeling as you imagined yourself at your best. A couple more deep breaths here. And if you'd like to set an intention for yourself, you can do that for the rest of your day. And then when you're ready to, you can open your eyes and come back to this present moment. Thank you, Aaron, very much. Um, I wanna just run through a little bit of what we would like to uh, accomplish in our time together today. Um, Josh is going to talk a little bit about um, the scope of the challenge of 
chronic pain in terms of um, uh, from a population standpoint. And then I will talk a little bit about um, how, how we have worked to change the paradigm of how we approach the, the challenge of chronic pain, um, what the program uh, structure looks like for those going through the program, and then Josh will pick up again uh, to talk a little bit about um, how we've created the, the payment system for the program um, and how we have um, looked at outcomes and what some of those outcomes uh, show. So Josh. Yeah, thank you, John. And thank you, Aaron. So I just want to touch on the scope of the problem. And as many of you know, chronic pain affects over 20.5% of the overall population. This from the National Health Interview Survey. And, and just to put that in perspective, um, between an 8 and to 10% of the population has diabetes. Uh, and the prevalence increases with age. So 40% of older adults from uh, New England Journal article. And then more specifically, high impact chronic pain where folks have functional disability as a result of the pain is 6.9%. And one of the target goals in Healthy People 2030. Um, from a societal standpoint, copious amounts of lost productive time loss, uh, lost by workers, 5.5 hours per week, and tons of money to in the, in the US economy, 635 billion. Next slide. So what we see and what we saw when I was working at the insurer is that folks who have comorbid medical and mental health conditions have 40% higher medical costs. And in our experience at our clinic, nearly all of our patients have comorbid mental health substance use disorder histories or current active conditions, and really a very strong history of trauma. And then I bring your attention to the new CDC guidelines where um, the focus is on multiple non-invasive, non-pharmacologic interventions uh, and, and with their associations and improvements in pain function and how we address chronic pain. So moving away from the pharmacologic model, the standard medical model to a more holistic and integrative model. And historically, and I was one of these primary care docs once upon a time, the burden of care falls to primary care with, who in the past we've had limited therapies and even more limited insurance coverage for things that we knew might work. So I'll let John uh, describe the program on the next slide and our approach. So um, I want to just set a little bit of context here. When I came over to the medical center five years ago, um, after a working group um, and medical center leadership had um, decided that we needed a different approach in our work with folks with chronic pain, um, a major impetus for that drive from the medical center's standpoint was the challenges that it was encountering with a group of about, at that time, 80 folks who were working with chronic pain, uh, who had been treated in accord with the standard of care, really, from the mid-90s up through the mid-teens of, of this century. Um, and that meant, really, a uh, unimodal approach with heavy reliance on both medications and procedures. And so when I came, that group of uh, 80 souls uh, had a combined average MME daily load of between 700 and 800 uh, MMEs. There were folks who were up around 2,000 MMEs, many of those folks on benzodiazepines. And those folks um, were not being well served um, by the current approach to care at all. And they were frequent visitors to the emergency room, to the inpatient setting. And so part of what is always interesting to me about, um, about our work with pain is how language defines um, our reality in some ways. And, and, and then that subsequently defines our approach to a problem. And I think pain is a, is a good example of that. So, so chronic pain means pain that's just going on and on, right? And, um, and that seems to define the problem. And then why wouldn't you approach that in the same way that you approach you know, my fractured ankle um, uh, when that happens or 
or some acute injury. But we know that um, pain really is, a, is an entirely, in many ways, consuming experience for people, that it involves every area of their life. Um, and that changes in relationships within the family system are incredibly frequent. They are often very socially isolated. They may have lost their, their identity uh, in their vocation or have that changed in some way. And often there are very real financial implications for folks who are dealing with chronic pain. Co-occurring mental health challenges, depression, anxiety, very high levels of previous trauma uh, for folks who are working with chronic pain. And so the outcome of all this tends to be a, a very profound isolation where folks don't feel seen or known uh, in their home environment, in their vocational environment, in their social system. Right, so this whole redefinition of self. Um, the other reality is that beyond that sense of isolation in those settings, they've been functioning in a medical system um, where they often are othered, right? That uh, as Josh alluded to, clinicians seeing them have a very limited repertoire of, um, of therapeutic options for them historically um, and may feel overwhelmed themselves. So. We really regard our mission here in terms of working with folks with chronic pain as, as being supportive of them, but also our goal is to try to um, be supportive of folks doing work in the primary care settings to offer some, some other alternatives in terms of approach. So this mission state, I love this part of our mission statement, um, you know, and, and we talk with folks when they come into the program about this, but yes, chronic pain is all that, it's challenging in all of those ways. But as, as part of this mortal life, it also holds richness in, in terms of what it may provide for additional wisdom, um, learning, growth, and that it actually you can find wellness in the midst of, of the experience of chronic pain. So what are we trying to do in the program? Well, we have a few major aims. One is to make sure that folks know from the very moment that they encounter us that they're seen in that experience. That, um, that we have looked at their story, um, that we know at least a, a beginning history of, of what's going on with them, and that our intention is to continue to grow in that learning as we go on. And so one way we do that is um, through the intake process, which is conducted by um, either a nurse practitioner or a physician here. Um, that story then is presented to the integrative case review team, which meets every Tuesday morning. So. Um, that group then makes suggestions about what they think might be helpful. The acupuncturist might have suggestions, the Reiki um, therapist might have suggestions, and then those suggestions are transmitted to the individual um, at their orientation, right? So we, we have looked at you, we have thought about you, here are some suggestions, um, but we want you to, in the end to take the reins of how you go through the program. Um, we also want people to know that we're here essentially to provide unconditional support, that a therapeutic environment um, is one that minimizes barriers to you in, in moving through the program, that every individual that you meet here is here because this is where they wanna be, right? Um, and our intention is, is, again, to provide all the support you need as you go through the program. So folks, as we've kind of talked about in traditional medical settings, you go in every three months or every six months and you may have a change in your dose of medication, you may have a, a medicine discontinued, you may be referred for a procedure. It's a very different dynamic than what we're striving for with folks. Um, we'd like them to make that transition from being dependent on that system to really having a sense of competence in working um, with the experience of chronic pain um, and, and to know that they can handle almost everything that comes up from them. But this is a huge lift for people, right? It's a lot, it's a lot, it's a big ask to say, we're moving from this paradigm where you've gone in and you get care to one where you're generating your own approach to care. Um, and so again, it takes a lot of courage, a lot of strength, and people need support um, in that process. And finally, one of our primary aims is to create a setting that's healthy for the folks working here. So 
by nature, um, work with folks who are suffering is, is hard, right? It takes a lot of energy, a lot of emotional energy. And so how do you, first of all, find individuals uh, who are compassionate, empathic, rigorous in their approach, well-boundaried, authentic? And then how do you sustain them as they do the work with individuals that are suffering? We rely really heavily um, on the teamwork that we do. We meet regularly as clinical teams, um, we meet regularly administratively. But the intention is to um, try to make sure that we're providing an environment where folks can find wellness in the midst of, of really tough work, of really challenging work. So what does the program look like? Well, it's, it's structured as a group program. The first, so individuals come in, they have their intake. Each group has about eight to 10 folks, usually sometimes up to 12. 12 is a bit more than, than I like, uh, just in terms of group process. The entire program is 16 weeks long. Each week, um, the folks in each cohort meet for either 90 or 120 minutes um, together as a group. And over those 16 weeks, the community that forms is almost uniformly very, very strong and an, an incredibly important part of the experience. Um, the first half of those sessions, the first eight weeks, um, they work with either the clinical social worker or the psychologist. And that um, segment is based on acceptance commitment therapy. The second half, um, historically, I have co-facilitated with Laurel Audi, who is Reiki um, practitioner and our coordinator of the program, also an RN. And starting now, other um, clinicians, including Josh and Terry Nauman, uh, Katie Applegate, our docs and MPs, will be co-facilitating that with Laurel. The second half is really designed to try and help people step back and frame the experience of chronic pain. Um, and, the, and that's conducted as a group medical visit. Um, and so physician or nurse practitioner and nurse co-facilitating the group, the cornerstones for that second segment are spirituality, mindfulness, community and connection, and self-compassion. Um, the segments, the, there are offerings as well during that 16 weeks um, that have to do with pain neuroscience education. There are cooking classes. There's a class offered um, on the use of cannabis uh, in chronic pain um, and health coaching available. We also want to make sure that the family system knows what's happening uh, in the program, right? And so three times during that 16 weeks, folks who are the primary support individual um, for the participant in the group um, come in and are offered a chance of connection and find out what's going on in the program. Subsequent to the program, folks are um, eligible to come in for a monthly alumni offering. And we'll talk a little bit more about what happens after the program as we go on through the presentation. So around those weekly group sessions, um, participants have uh, access to all of these therapies, right? And, and so it can be um, a very full experience. And part of the message to folks when they start is to pace yourself a little bit. Um, but again, the participant has the reins in the program, right? So, so we work to, to kind of guide them and make sure that we're aware of what they're doing in the program. We are aware of what they're doing in the program and make sure that they're um, pacing themselves in a way that allows them to get the most uh, out, of, out of the entire program. Um, the key ingredient here from the staff standpoint is that the environment, the work environment is intentionally transdisciplinary. So it's not that individuals are seen here for their group and then they go out to a practice to see the acupuncturist. Um, and it's not that the acupuncturist just shows up here on Tuesday afternoons. It's that um, everybody in these who's providing the therapies, the integrative therapies, is here um, a good portion of the week. It might be two or three ha half days for an individual therapist, but we all convene together for the case reviews. Um, and so there's a tremendous amount of uh, wisdom exchanged, um, both in those case reviews. I've heard things that I knew nothing about from, uh, from each of the therapists involved. Um, and that exchange is bi-directional, right? And so the intention is for us as clinicians to grow in our awareness and wisdom, but also to find um, the best answer for the person. So in those formal case reviews, that happens, and it happens every day in the hallway. Hey, I saw, you know, I saw John Porter, and 
this is going on and this is going on. Do you have any suggestions for me or can, can you, from your approach, um, help him uh, move forward? And this is a screenshot um, of one of those case reviews. So, so here we have allopathic folks. We have folks trained in craniosacral therapy, uh, massage. We have physical therapists, occupational therapists, Reiki. Um, and so those are very robust, uh, vibrant meetings. There's often um, kind of healthy humor involved. Um, and they're, they're meetings that I think we all look forward to um, as part of our week. Josh. Yeah, so now we've gone over the program, the, the, I wanna bring your attention to some degree to my previous job, but really why um, our insurers, would, might insurers be interested in supporting this work? Um, and, and so I'll draw your attention to the bottom and rather than the top of this list of things, um, because I think it's important. So as the VP, and Chief Medical Officer at Blue Cross, we knew that musculoskeletal procedures, diagnoses, utilization was the highest cost driver for our patients, for our members, for our clients, the employers who are paying for the care. Um, and, and there was a significant you know, variation in the chronic pain population in terms of both utilization of interventional procedures, of course, imaging and pharma pharmaceuticals. We also knew, and in the state, have been affected by the opioid uh, addiction crisis. And we knew that this was one possible entry into that, that potential. And, and we also, as an insurer, wanted to be forward looking. How do we enter value-based care in a supportive way that helps all of the stakeholders. Um, and so how do we create that provider payer partnership uh, leading healthcare transformation in the state of Vermont? So we really believe that surprisingly, but we did. Uh, and, uh, and then the question was, okay, so how do we do this uh, on a system-wide level so that we can scale it and recruit other providers? How can we make this sustainable so in a fee-for-service model, you can imagine that the services that we just spoke of um, historically are not priced appropriately to the amount of work that would go into a project like this. And so we collectively, uh, in partnership with UVM Medical Center, decided to move forward with the bundle payment model uh, focused on outcomes. Um, and then, of course, our goal long term is to kind of serve the population across the region, including expanding to other sites of care, um, and then respond to our, our, our members who are seeking integrative care, um, seeking acupuncture, seeking Reiki, seeking massage, which is not a covered benefit and um, clearly impedes access to the proven and valuable care. And then we wanted to kind of create this center of excellence. So we had been doing this and thinking about this in parallel to Dr. Porter and UVM for at least six years now uh, is when we start to think about this. And in fact, uh, there were three sites in Vermont that were discussed, two started and one sustained. This is the nature of new um, the new uh, innovations. Uh, and uh, that was the academic center, an independent group of providers, and then a community health uh, system in Southern Vermont. Uh, and we, we can talk about some of the barriers to why those didn't succeed uh, a little bit later, uh, but I think it was very instructive. So next slide. So just, reflections on you know working with providers and payers i mean everyone has their their unique perspective people they have to satisfy differing priorities and you have to come to it with an open mind and understand what their focus are and sometimes you have to ask um communication as always is is the the bedrock of of this this work and it's all about relationships um and, and follow through with meaningful and timely action. So if we say we're gonna meet, 
we go meet, if we say we're gonna do something, we do it. Um, John and I, when we were on opposite sides, if you will, in the insurance and the payer, um, met, I think we started meeting weekly when we, when we were planning this. And then now we meet monthly years into it, but we still meet monthly to discuss the program and how uh, patients are experiencing it from both a operational kind of insurance perspective and then the outcomes uh, and the work done here. And I would say that pairs in general, while they're difficult to work with, are open to coverage with evidence determination, are open to kind of laboratory investigational work, as long as they're at the table and they're able to partner. And in fact, um, the you'll see a lot of the research that we did certainly was created the context, context and the framework was created by UBM, but the analytics, some, much of it was done at, at Blue Cross. And so it was a, a, a very direct partnership. Um, and then, you know, the, the goal is to demonstrate value and scale using SMART goals. Next slide. So just to touch on the utilization measures and the outcomes measures, and, and just to say, Blue Cross didn't come up with this. We, I think we jointly agreed on domains that we wanted to explore of outcomes that were important to patients. And then we allowed the, the academic center to kind of pick the scales, the survey instruments that made sense. Um, and then the insurer focused on the financial and utilization measures that made sense to them and their clients. And so as you can see on the left, we use the DBPRS and the PEG um, heavy focus on the Promise 29 as a functional outcome measure. Um, brief resilience, which is an important thing. Self-compassion scale can't underscore more the importance of self-compassion in this population and the loss that people have coming into it. Um, the chronic pain acceptance questionnaire and then something called the health competence scale, which is uh, actually developed by the Dartmouth Primary Care Co-op. Just simple scale of um, how confident are you in managing your chronic health condition, in this condition, pain, in this instance, pain. And then on the, on the utilization side, you know, all the various iterations of the medical, that's the per member per month cost. That's a standard uh, description in the insurance industry. So the prescription per member per month, the medical together, the diagnostic related group of musculoskeletal, interventional pain cost, pain management, which is really opioids, code, uh, PM, PM, and then ER visits. Turns out that this population doesn't get admitted to the hospital too much, but they go to the ER a lot. Uh, next slide. So let's jump into some of the outcomes. Um, and again, these are, this is a pilot program. So the outcomes were pre-post. We have not done six and 12 month follow-up because we this was a pilot and we didn't have an infrastructure to do that. We will be doing that in the future. So uh, our all, and just as a preface, all of the outcomes are statistically significant. So here's our PEG, average pain in the last week, interference uh, with life enjoyment and with general activity, all significant improvements in that short term uh, pre post 16 weeks. Next slide. Here's kind of a big slide of the Promise 29, but again, improvements in all the domains of the Promise 29, which includes anxiety and depression and function and social roles and activities, which in Blue Cross speak translates to um, presenteeism, to productivity at work. Um, although we did not have a specific presenteeism measure. Uh, next slide. Here are our outcomes in terms of the brief resilience and self-compassion scales, which were quite significant. And this is a lot of the work we do. This really is reflective of the, the, the connection that people make within the program and in, within themselves and the agency. And then chronic pain acceptance and health confidence, uh, all, all improved as well. So let's jump to the financial outcomes, which is the next slide. So um, here we have the medical per member per month, 
our X per member per month the together and the, and the musculoskeletal. And as you can see, consistent decrease over time. Uh, in, this, in, in the financial outcomes, just to frame this, were 12 months pre, 12 months post. So much this speaks to the durability of the outcomes, at least a hint uh, towards the durability of the outcomes. And uh, I will point out that um, the, uh, that musculoskeletal 30% decrease is very meaningful to a pair. Next slide. Now we have a 25% decrease in interventional pain procedures in this population pre-post, and then a 28% decrease in the overall costs. One could uh, infer that it's utilization as well, of course, in, in the uh, pain prescriptions. And that, that interventional pain decrease is pretty consistent with other programs out there that, have, that, work, that are successful in working with populations with a high impact chronic pain. Next slide. And here we have the ER visit decrease. So um, pretty impressive 65 and 67% decrease in ER utilization. And, and the left is all diagnosis and then pain related diagnosis. Um, this was uh, in a population of 120 patients, just to give you the N if you will. And um, we will continue to study this, but we've kind of created a framework uh, for both the utilization and the outcome study of the of, in this population for this program. Uh, next slide. So I just want to step back and, and John and I will both talk about this, but Blue Cross is very interested in expanding this program because patients have experience excellent outcomes, give them positive feedback, and they see a decrease in inappropriate or adverse utilization. So, um, and, and on, the, on the provider side, I would say it, it, it is a framework which com combats uh, provider burnout and, and, and the burden that, that, that we had uh, historically in this structure. So from a, a quadruple aim pro, uh, pro, uh, perspective, um, it, it really kind of hits all of the points. We do need to create a alumni program in primary care. So once people have gone through the program, how do we, how do they sustain the gains they made? How do they access services in a system financially sustainable way for them uh, that worked for them. Let's say it's Reiki and massage, um, which are standardly non-covered items within health insurance. And so we are working with Blue Cross right now uh, to create a primary care bundle that mirrors this and creates a sustainable model for our patients who have um, made great gains in the program. Uh, John, you want to take a couple more of these? Yeah, I think, um, thanks, Josh, very much. Um, I'm, I'm going to reiterate what we're trying to do in the primary care setting, both in terms of the experience of the folks who've been through the program, and again, also in the spirit of uh, and work of supporting um, folks who are in the primary care setting doing really challenging work. We are looking at an inpatient model uh, for integrative services and trying to learn uh, from some of the work that has been done uh, in that arena. Um, you know, it's a pretty common uh, complaint for the trauma surgeons that they, they see their folks in the hospital, they're discharged on high MME uh, medication load, and then they come back to the surgeon several weeks later uh, needing refills. So this idea of a of a pain doula, uh, somebody who can work with education, who can coordinate integrative services within the inpatient setting, use this facility as a transition point to provide um, support and uh, weaning off medications once they are discharged and then back to primary care. Um, one of our real regrets is that uh, we're running a two-tier system here, right? Thanks to Josh and um, Blue Cross Blue Shield's forward-looking um, nature we were able to engage um, with Blue Cross Blue Shield in designing this bundle. 
now we really want to um, go deeper and we want to cover more folks um, who may not have access who do not have access to these services and that includes medicaid eventually medicare but other private insurers um, and i think i just would mention that the cost of the program for the 16-week program these are low intensity services right and so um, we can provide these this program for the cost of somewhere around one and a half epidural injections, uh, you know, in, into the lumbosacral spine. We need our anesthesiology co colleagues, there's no doubt about it, but, but this again is a real shift in paradigm in terms of trying to create a, a vehicle that lets folks move forward in their lives with less dependent on, on medicines and, and procedures. We haven't published that, we have the, something coming along, uh, we need to get our findings out um, and, and develop our research uh, capabilities. And uh, Peter's been gracious in talking with us uh, about how we are, are gonna continue to work in doing that. Um, and then I would just say that if um, there's a link on our site that um, is really a video that has um, several individuals who participate in the program talking about their experience, it just gives a nice um, kind of tone, sense of the tone of the program um, and and what folks have found as they've as they've moved through. I, I do want to um, touch base and round out my comments earlier about the other sites that um, did not continue, and and it relates to this next steps discussion. One of the sites was a, uh, a community uh, hospital in Brattleboro. Um, partnering with the community uh, mental health provider to provide this, to create a clinic together. Um, they are in an area in which just providing the bundle for the Blue Cross population was not enough financially to make it worth their while to build a program. So, you know, kudos to UVM for making that investment, but um, the penetration or the, the percentage of patients who had Blue Cross in the local area was high enough to make it worth their while. What that hospital said was, if Medicaid were on board, if Medicaid were part of the bundle, we could see our way forward to creating a center of excellence in the southern part of the state. Um, and, and so that, that still is out there. And so that is true for other community hospitals or community entities, not just hospitals, um, who might be interested in, in building and replicating this model. Having one insurer pay for the bundle is not, not enough, number one. Uh, the second comment was uh, the other of the three that um, did, did uh, close down was a group of independent providers uh, centered around an independent physiatrist who uh, ran a program, they were co-located in the same building. So a lot of integrated practitioners, um, physiatry, uh, all in, and PT, I think all in the same space. Um, and they were able to create kind of a virtual. The feedback I got from them was they had intention to have a transdisciplinary model but to actually effectively do so was very difficult because they were physically separated, even if they were in the same building. And, and so the formal meetings to, to discuss patients happened, the informal really never did. Um, and so that, that kind of an attention and intention to that detail was lost in there. And then uh, I believe a couple of providers moved on to different sites and, and really thing just fell apart in the end. And, um, and Josh, that does just to say that in the bundle, um, there there is there are funds available for those meetings, right? For those yeah. sixty-minute case review meetings um, that happen every week, and for other other times that we need to coordinate care for folks. So that was deliberately, intentionally built into the to the budget. It's one reason that we can actually have that otherwise non-billable time uh, for. And and to that point, John, and there may be some questions on this, you know, the way the bundle was built was in partnership with the provider. So, you know, the question was, okay, so for this amount of time, what would, what, what services would you expect a patient to use over 
that amount of time. And then we created the bundle from that with a little bit of wiggle room for um, expansion. And um, we also then, because it was a new innovation, we did a shadow fee-for-service tracking to ensure that the actual utilization of services well, on both sides matched what the bundle was. And then we had an intent to uh, adjust the bundle if needed. Yeah. And I'll say one more thing and then we're, we'll got break. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, this is the tension, right, between a population health approach and a fee-for-service model. And we're, as they say, one foot in each canoe here. Um, but as you can tell, as I've alluded to, this is for the medical center, not a tremendous revenue generator, that the savings from this come over time, right? We, we sit adjacent to the building where um, the anesthesiology group does their interventional work. Um, and right now, they're, you know, they are a major um, resource generator for the medical center. So, so as the, as we kind of, again, rotate the prism and move towards a feet towards a population health basis, this program uh, looks stronger and stronger. Um, but in the short run, it, it's an active faith, a leap of faith for, you know, for leadership administration to, to carry this out. So I'll, I'll stop there. Josh, you and I could probably go on all day back and forth. No, it's probably worthwhile. There's some great questions in the chat and I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, you guys kind of uh, facilitate which ones to answer, but um, they're all good questions. Should I just go in order or? I, I think um, Gloria can help moderate, I think. Yeah, Gloria. Emma, could you please, um, let me see, get me onto the screen here. Well, I, you can hear my voice, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, thank you so much for this, uh, the wonderful presentation. You're right, there's um, a plenty of questions here, and I sort of see a few bins, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and um, kind of try to bin them together. Um, the first the first area is really about just, uh, you know, for people who are trying to maybe start a program similar to this at their own site, you know, um, you talked about you know, finding a willing audience of stakeholders and decision makers who will listen to your idea and then meet with them many times, right? Like that was underlined. And, and I guess um, for me, it's like, it's the, it's the finding part. Like ha, um, I think uh, in your case, very lucky to have Dr. Um, um, Plavin, uh, you know, role, uh, prior role at Blue Cross Blue Shield and, and um, you know, had that sort of open ear, but uh, any, any, advice for folks to sort of, you know, get to that, get to first base there. Um. Yeah, Josh, you may chime in. I would just say that, you know, we, we reviewed the prevalence of, of this challenge for people uh, at the beginning. And, it, you know, if you look at how the numbers translate, for example, to the Boston metropolitan area, there's 260,000 people theoretically who are experiencing high impact pain, you know, pain for at least six months with interference in one major arena of life during that time. So, so this is an incredibly costly uh, problem to people, both in terms of cost to the system, but also in terms of the cost of quality of life. Um, so, so highly prevalent condition uh, for which we have not found a satisfactory answer. And we still, as you know, from the program, we can't take the pain away, but how do you, how do you move people towards wellness in that experience? So I think you know, pounding the doors, meeting, and it's part of what we do here is we meet regularly with leadership, um, but keeping keeping communication going about the, the challenge of the issue. And I think really in a post-COVID time or almost post-COVID time, we hope, um, you know, the, the stress on the primary care setting in terms of working with folks um, in, in 15 or 20 minute appointments, that just is, is not the right approach in terms of arriving at best care. Josh, do you? Have yeah, I think you need to find one, you need to find the Josh. You need to find the one person at the insurance company who maybe is the director of healthcare reform or one of the medical directors who is a sympathetic ear and can get that elevator speech, understand the importance to the system and the insurer. And then at the same time, um, they need to go shop this idea within their organization, as much as John had to shop this idea within the 
provider organization. It was tough yeoman's kind of individual meeting work on both sides to even get this going. And it wasn't just a one-time thing. It takes persistence um, and that regular communication. So finding that connection is really important. Um, and then having them being your champion, if you will, I'm, I'm speaking as a provider, them being your champion within the pair um, to move this forward. And usually it's the director of healthcare reform or some kind of uh, role. They're all different in all the insurers. And, and you know, it's, it's pick a couple of your highest, your volume insurers, you can't hit everyone. Um, uh, and, and down there, you probably have maybe three that come to mind. Um, and, uh, and, and, and don't be, you're going to fail more times that you're going to succeed and that's okay. Uh, but you will make progress and, and, and move this forward. Having, once we publish this and having this model kind of known will be a way, one of the ways to open the door Yeah. because the blue cross system is, is becoming aware of this program because of the way in which they uh, spread innovation. Uh, and so Blue Cross Vermont is, will also serve as a uh, coach for other insurers, I suspect. Yeah, for sure. So thank you for paving that way. I do think that having these models are really important. Um, and I it sounds like persistence is important too. Um, so um, another sort of big, big, um, like Tai Chi or Pilates or sort of movement-based, um, you know, mind-body therapies, you know, acupuncture, chiropractic. Um, can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, it, and I will say, first of all, the program is intrinsically um, iterative, right? So we're always learning and, and trying to figure out what's most helpful. A heavy influence early on was was trying to provide access to therapies that are not covered by traditional uh, payer systems, and so so that was the initial choice. We continue to reevaluate and 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 figure out how to incorporate other therapies that we know will be uh, useful, and that does include things like chiropractic um, movement. We have a we have a yoga therapist. Aaron is is doing that work along with one other person here, um, but we're always trying to figure out how to kind of add more therapies within the, the challenges of space and, and time here in the office. But yeah, initially- Yeah, the yeah there, there is an operational I issue. And yeah, we have acupuncture as part of the program, but um, I, I would also say Vermont may be different than other states. Chiropractic is mandated to be covered in the state as is naturopathic doctors as primary care. So that is not a, an access or barrier to coverage right now. Having said that, I believe Dr. Porter has been talking to a chiropractor who's very interested in joining the program. So, I mean, we have plenty of people who are interested in joining. It, it is a, an operational mm -hmm. challenge, um, space, time issues that come up um, that you need to struggle. And it sounds like perhaps sort of playing to the strengths of the center of what you already have in the beginning, at least for someone starting up. Um, yeah. Um, so I, one related question for that is, is um, that I was really intrigued by your uh, sort of difference or, or pointing out the difference between maybe multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and truly transdisciplinary. And I guess um, is, is the crux of that just the uh, opportunities for kind of more informal interactions on a daily basis or what, what's, what's, What's that real difference there? It's subtle, I feel. Um, yeah, it uh, there is a subtlety there, Gloria, and I. But it has to do with flow of of care of the participant, right? That in in real time, the massage craniosacral therapist saying to the yoga therapist, "Hey, um, here's what I'm seeing," or the acupuncturist will say to the Reiki clinician, "You know, gee, I think if you came in before, um, we we." started the treatment with the needles, it would be helpful. And we've, we've actually had several folks who have benefited from that combination. So the combinations of care that pop up um, that just wouldn't be possible if people are in different offices has been really helpful to us. Yeah, yeah it's subtle, but it's, it's very real. There's a flow in the integrated case review and in the day-to-day -day clinical work that 
that has an ease to it um, that I think leads to better outcomes. John. And I, and I think these patients have been traumatized by the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And their success in the program is all about the engagement with the work that we do. And then finally, uh, many of these patients have rapid changes in their status, flares in their pain, and then that, or flares in their emotional state or their financial issues that come up that create a catastrophic a, a moment in time. And coalescing the team around that patient um, is much easier to do if you're sharing space and, and having those informal interactions than if you were in multiple different yeah. locations. And, and kind of meeting that patient and maintaining. Yeah. yeah. And, and the heft of that challenge is shared by a team, right? That the, right. For, the, for the clinicians, yeah. Yeah. Um, so in our last couple minutes, I actually wanted to get in a couple questions regarding um, just sort of thinking about future resource, research and then also your, um, I guess the, the, the pilot that you're doing currently. Um, and maybe some limitations of that and, and where you can go from here. I guess the, the, the question is um, in it, more sort of this is pragmatic observational sort of data that you're, that you're um, collecting, which is, which is so important um, and, um, you know, as that first step. But uh, if it's not controlled, um, you know, without a control group, um, you know, what, what limitations, you know, does that have and, and um, you know, what, what are you thinking in terms of the next steps? Um, you know, are there any uh, formal cost-effective analyses? Um, you know that you might think about. Um, so there's some folks that uh, suggested maybe return to work outcomes um, and thinking about like chronic pain prevention um, and um, and not just sort of the acute treatment. So, mm -hmm. any thoughts on any any or all of those? That's a that's a big bin, Josh. Do you have it in there? <laughs> yeah, which is great. Do you have a thought, Josh? Well, yeah, I think that is the, the logical and appropriate next step to create that cohort case control um, kind of uh, population. We need, uh, we will need access to data. And, and we are building at UVM a claims warehouse through our ACO. So we have a statewide ACO. So we may be able to utilize that as our control data population. Um, and um, then that will allow us to uh, better study the, 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 the program. And then there's, there's also um, implementation research that can be done here that is also very important and, and a multi-site. So how do you, so we built the program in one site. How do you then translate that to another site? And then how do you replicate that with adherence to fidelity of the program to multiple sites so that you have a system, you're building a system. Um, so that that all is, you know, robust research space, uh, which we um, would like to enter as well. So yeah, there, there's a lot to be done. And we have to start somewhere. Absolutely, and really exciting, really exciting. Um, I think it's gonna, you know, move the needle uh, nationwide in terms of, you know, what we're doing. We're in this opportune, opportune time, opportune space. I think, you know, the COVID pandemic really did create some opportunities, um, you know, ironically, uh, that, uh, that we might, wouldn't have had um, so quickly. So um, we are at the top of the hour, but any last um, thoughts that you want to offer to the audience? Uh, yeah, I would just say upward, right? I think we're all trying to, um, to work and figure out how new paradigms can be helpful for folks. And I think this as a model of a chronic condition is something that uh, has, has components that will be very useful and transferable. Um, and I think of medical group visits and I think of integrative therapies. And so again, we will keep asking questions here and keep confusing ourselves about what's happening and then picking a way forward. Um, but it, it, that is the work, right? Yeah. And, and, and think of this as a template for chronic condition care more broadly as well. Um, not just right. for chronic pain. Yeah. So uh, lifestyle medicine is a component, et cetera. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here for, for transformation in the system and to create an integrative health system uh, collaboratively. Yeah, great. 
Thank you so much for all of the work that you put into this program. I, it, it really is a model that the, the rest of us are all, um, you know, wanting to emulate. And um, and thank you again for sharing with us today with really lots of rich information. I'm, we could go on for another, you know, all day actually with answering these questions um, and discussion. So thank you, John. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Aaron, uh, for, for the lovely uh, meditation in the beginning. And um, um, everybody, uh, I'm going to close out the session today and hope that you'll all join us um, next month, March 7th, for, um, for our next Grand Rounds. Okay. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you very much.